In this introduction, I will attempt to lay out some fundamental ideas for contextualizing and better understanding a few of the modern mythologies we find in filmic cinema. In order to examine, for example, the modern anti-hero complex depicted throughout so many films nowadays, then we must first establish the historic role of that character trait in the artifacts of man-made media prior to this present writing, 2020 AD. Thus, to do so, we must begin by looking at the multiple themes that intertwine to form this character's primary aspects. Then, examining their origins and histories, we may more fully comprehend the complete character of the modern anti-hero. Firstly, the primary characteristic of the anti-hero is that they are both hero and villain, either simultaneously, from differing points of view, or else over time. If a character is both hero and villain at once, it is most usually while passing th between being solely or more so one than the other. Portraying these pivotal moments of transformation in epic cinema has been one of the major focal points of film over the past several years, particularly leading up to the turn of the millennium in 2000 AD. This rite of passage for an individual from one point of view to another portrays on the silver screen a reflection for our own political pendulum process that itself reverses back and forth between two opposite extremes, only to come back around full circle after long durations of time. So what is characteristic of a hero, and what of a villain? Heroism has proven true of those courageous enough to be kind, while villainy remains defined by an unquenchable lust for power. Almost everyone thinks of themselves as the hero of their own life story. However, few realize the villainy they may leave in their wake most choose to take credit for the good in their autobiography and attribute the rest to a novel author that is, in some form, their own imaginary idea of God controlling their fate. Thus, almost all people suffer from a form of false pride, for even those constructions we build for social posterity will one day be nothing but dust. Not only can we not take it with us when we die, we cannot even hope to leave any truly indelible mark on the face of history with our time here either. Thus, any meaning or goal we may wish for our life to have, all such notions are futile and ultimately impossible to realize in the end. Hence, the irony is that we are all guilty for original sin, having within us even only this potential for egotism. This idea of excessive pride, Greek hubris, being punished by the law of irony through some naturally occurring often self-inflicted, twist of fate, was already an ancient concept when the idea of a free and open society founded on a democratic republic, constituted government, was first formulated. However, the notion of such a government's inevitable pull into a pendulous cycle of reversals between opposing political parties, that is, obviously, the result of such irony on the scale of nations, remains considered merely a theory of one kind or another today.
perhaps best known now from the 8 A.D. Latin epic poem, The Metamorphoses, 8 dot 183 to 235 by the Roman poet Ovid 43 BC until 18 AD The legend of Icarus was an ancient Greek myth on the moral of pride Greek hubris According to this story Icarus's father, Daedalus, a savant Athenian craftsman of antiquity, built the labyrinth for King Midas of Crete near his palace at Knossos to imprison the Minotaur, a half-man, half-bull monster born of his wife, Pacify, and the Cretan bull. Midas imprisoned Daedalus himself in the labyrinth when Daedalus gave Midas' daughter Ariadne a clue or ball of string in order to help Theseus, Midas' enemy, survive the labyrinth and defeat the Minotaur. To escape the island, Daedalus fashioned two pairs of wings out of wax and feathers for himself and his son, Icarus. Daedalus warned Icarus not to fly too close to the sun, so the sun's heat would not melt his wings, nor too close to the sea, so the sea's dampness would not clog them. Icarus flew too high, and thus the sun melted his wings and he fell to his death in the Aegean Sea, southwest of Samos Island. Although the story of Oedipus Rex is best known from the surviving play by Sophocles, 497 until 405 BC, many significant elements of the myth of Oedipus take place prior to the events of this play. The myth begins with Laius, when he was prince of Thebes, a city-state, Greek polis, in Boeotia, central Greece. Laius was taken in as a guest by Pelops, king of Elis, in southern Greece on the Peloponnese where he was to be the tutor to the king's youngest son, Chrysippus, in chariot racing. Laius is accused of raping Chrysippus, whom then, according to some versions, kills himself in shame. Subsequently, Laius weds Jocasta, and they ascend as the king and queen of Thebes. However, the ongoing misfortunes of Thebes are believed to be the result of a curse laid upon Laius for his violating the sacred laws of hospitality, Greek, Xenia. When Laius and Jocasta's son, Oedipus, is born, Laius consults an oracle for advice on the child's future. The oracle reveals that Laius is doomed to perish by the hand of his own son. Upon hearing this omen, Laius bounds Oedipus' feet and orders him cast out to a mountaintop to die from exposure. A shepherd discovers Oedipus and brings him to Corinth, a city on the Isthmus of Corinth, the narrow stretch of land that joins the Peloponnese to the mainland of Greece, roughly halfway between Athens and Sparta. The shepherd presents the infant to the childless rulers of Corinth, King Polybus and Queen Merope, 
and they then raise Oedipus as their own son. One day, Oedipus hears a rumor. He is actually not the son of Polybus and Merope. So he consults the Delphic Oracle, and is advised by it that he is destined to mate with his own mother, and shed with his own hands the blood of his own sire. Upon hearing this omen, Oedipus flees to the city of Thebes. At a crossroads, Oedipus and an old man get into an argument over whom has the right of way, and Oedipus, pulling the old man down from his chariot, kills him. In order to enter the city of Thebes, Oedipus must first pass by a sphinx, a legendary beast with the head and breasts of a woman, the body of a lioness, and the wings of an eagle that was eating anyone who tried to pass by. The sphinx poses Oedipus' answer a riddle. What is it that walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three legs in the evening? Oedipus correctly answers, man, Greek, Anthropus, who crawls on all fours as an infant, walks upright in maturity, and leans on a stick in old age. The Sphinx then departs, and Oedipus enters Thebes, where he finds his reward for freeing Thebes from the Sphinx, is kingship of the city, and the hand of its dowager queen, Jocasta. Eventually, as described in the events of the play by Sophocles, Oedipus Rex discovers that Jocasta is his own birth mother, and that the old man he'd killed at the crossroads was Laius, his father and former king of Thebes. Jocasta then kills herself, and Oedipus, cursing his fate, picks up her sewing needles and puts out his own eyes. The moral, as recited by the chorus, is that no man should be considered fortunate until he is dead. Thus, the punishment by the gods for mankind's hubris was already generally accepted by the ancient Greeks to be manifest naturally by the universal law of irony. Sophocles, 497 until 405 BC, wrote over 120 plays and was, for almost 50 years, the most celebrated playwright in the dramatic competitions of the city-state of Athens, which took place during the religious festivals of the Linnea in the month of Poseidon, the month straddling the winter solstice i.e. December and January, and the Dionysia, held from the 10th to the 16th of the month Elephibilon, the lunar month straddling the vernal equinox, i.e. March and April, in the solar calendar. Plato, 428 until 347, was an Athenian philosopher during the classical period in ancient Greece and founder of the Academy, the first institution of higher learning in the Western world. Plato was thus a late contemporary of Sophocles, whom was 69 when Plato was born, and whom died at age 92 the year Plato turned 23. And, therefore, Plato's model of benevolent despotism 
was highly likely informed by Sophocles' work Oedipus Rex, first performed around 429, one year prior to Plato's birth. In Plato's Republic, his protagonist, Athenian Greek philosopher Socrates, 470 until 399 BC, asks which is better, a bad democracy or a country reigned by a tyrant? He argues that it is better to be ruled by a bad tyrant than by a bad democracy, since here all the people are now responsible for such actions, rather than only one individual committing many bad deeds. Socrates asserts that societies have a tripartite class structure corresponding to the appetite, spirit, reason, structure of the individual soul. Productive citizens, workers, the laborers, carpenters, plumbers, masons, merchants, farmers, ranchers, etc. These correspond to the appetite part of the soul. Protective soldiers, warriors or guardians, those who are adventurous, strong, and brave, and in the armed forces. These correspond to the spirit part of the soul. Governing politicians, rulers or philosopher kings, those who are intelligent, rational, self-controlled, in love with wisdom, well-suited to make decisions for the community. These correspond to the reason part of the soul and are very few. According to Socrates, a state made up of different kinds of souls will, overall, decline from an aristocracy ruled by the best to a timocracy ruled by the honorable, then to an oligarchy ruled by the few, then to a democracy ruled by the people, and finally descend into tyranny, ruled by one person, the tyrant. Aristocracy in the sense of government, Greek politeia, is advocated in Plato's Republic. This regime is ruled by a philosopher king, and thus is grounded, according to Socrates, on wisdom and reason. In 399 BC, Socrates went on trial. The accuser, Miletus, swore out testimony against Socrates before the Archon, a state officer with mostly religious duties, whom considered the evidence and de determined that there was an actionable case of moral corruption of Athenian youth and impiety against the Greek philosopher. Athenian juries were drawn by lottery from a group of hundreds of male citizen volunteers. Such a large jury usually ensured a majority verdict in a trial. By this manner, Socrates was found guilty of both corrupting the minds of the youth of Athens and of impiety. Greek, asibia, literally meaning not believing in the gods of the state, and as punishment was sentenced to death. Therefore, faithful to his teaching of civic obedience to the law, the seven-year-old Socrates committed suicide by drinking the prescribed poisonous hemlock. 
clearly in the old world the axiom of the age was irony. The presence of irony is thick in both the mythic fiction of Oedipus and the epic fate of Socrates, both of whom died as martyrs to this force. In the case of Oedipus, as premised by Roy Glassberg, in April 2017 AD, in his review of the work for Philosophy and Literature, Volume 41, Number 1, Oedipus, quote, is unaware that he is the one polluting agent he seeks to punish. End quote. Likewise, after his conviction, Socrates, seemingly blind to his impending peril, joked that he be punished with free meals at the Prytheneum, the city's sacred hearth, an honor usually held for a benefactor of Athens and for the victorious athletes of an Olympiad. Both men saw themselves unquestioningly as heroes, and in both cases their hubris preceded their fall. The trial of Socrates may also be seen as a precursor to and philosophical justification for the assassination on the Ides, the 15th, of March, in the year we now call 44 BC, of Gaius Julius Caesar, 100 until 44 BC. Having been declared Imperator for life over Rome and all its provinces, almost a year to the day before his murder, 60 senators stabbed Emperor Caesar 23 times, and his corpse bled out across the floor of the Roman Senate. Despite the death of Caesar, the conspirators were unable to restore the institutions of the Republic. The ramifications of the assassination led to the Liberator's civil war and ultimately to the Principate period of the Roman Empire. With the assassination of Caesar, once more the law was upheld, as with Socrates and Oedipus before him, that should anyone rise too high in popularity and authority, they pose a threat to the health of the state and will therefore be punished by the gods that govern man's mortal fate. This brings us up to date with the era of the so-called New Testament and the lifetime of Jesus of Nazareth, 4 B.C. until 29 A.D. The concept of Messianism originated in Judaism and in Jewish eschatology, the Messiah is defined as a future Jewish king from the Davidic royal bloodline, who is expected to rule the Jewish people during the end of days and world to come. Jesus of Nazareth was a first century Jewish preacher and religious leader who has become the central figure of Christianity, the world's largest religion. Most Christians believe he was the incarnation of the Son of God and the Messiah, Greek Christos, prophesied about in the Old Testament. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught what has come to be called his antitheses of Matthew 5, 17 through 48 in which he refutes the Ten Commandments as the core of Hebrew law and presupposes, love your enemy, instead of the old world way of an eye for an eye. By this teaching, Jesus sought to philosophically separate irony 
from ethics that mankind may practice either without interference by the other. It was because of these reasons, being proclaimed a false messiah and for teaching refutations of the commandments, among other charges, that Jesus was tried by the Jerusalem Sanhedrin of his day, condemned to death, and slaughtered by crucifixion. The irony of the punishment for this Prince of Peace being such a torturous death once more reinforced that ancient moral that no one can rise too high without being brought down by fate. Following the 410 AD sack of Rome by the Visigoths, St. Augustine of Hippo Regius Algeria, 354 until 430, would write on the city of God against the pagans, which argues against what many Romans believed, that the Visigoths were a punishment for abandoning traditional polytheist religions for Christianity, and posits that Christianity was not responsible for the sack of Rome, but was instead responsible for Rome's successes. Even if the earthly rule of the empire was imperiled, it was the city of God that would ultimately triumph. Hence, Christendom was, from its start, founded on the parallel pillars of irony, the arbitrary law of kings over serfs, and ethics, which would eventually lead to political democracies and even some claim to socialist economics. Karl Popper proposed what he called the paradox of tolerance. As recently as 1945 AD, in his work, The Open Society and Its Enemies, Volume 1, The Age of Plato. However, therein, he traces the origins for the concept back to Plato's defense of Socrates' notion of benevolent despotism. In Popper's work, he defines the paradox of tolerance. Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. He further adumbrates that in order to maintain a tolerant society, the society must be intolerant of intolerance. And concludes, We should therefore claim, in the name of tolerance, the right not to tolerate the intolerant. While Plato had dispensed with this apparent paradox, simply enough by proposing, essentially, that autocratic dictate by an enlightened philosopher king would be preferable to leaving the question of tolerance up to majority rule. By the lifetime of third U.S. President Thomas Jefferson, 1743 until July 4, 1826, political institutions within liberal democracies had become preferable to Plato's vision of benevolent tyranny. And so, in Jefferson's first inaugural speech, he addressed the notion of how tolerant societies must deal with the intolerant by saying, Let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it. 
on April 27, 1961 A.D. 35th U.S. President John F. Kennedy 1917 until November 22, 1963 delivered a speech to the American Newspaper Publishers Association describing a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. In this speech, Kennedy stated, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society, and we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control, and no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. Kennedy went on to add, A wise man once said, An error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. The wise man, Kennedy quoted, was Orlando Aloysius Batista, 1917 until 1995, a Canadian-American chemist, author, and JFK's fellow devout Catholic. Kennedy concluded, We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy, and that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment. By now, the alternative to Plato's benevolent despotism of the free and open society promised by a democratic republic constitutionalized government, has largely been accepted, and the majority of Earth's nations today have similar governments, with the hope of yielding similar results for their own cultures, as that of the USA. These nations may be collectively summed up as Western civilization, Although following the collapse of Sovietism in Russia on November 9, 1989 AD, the model of a democratic republic format for government is no longer accepted solely in the Western Hemisphere, but now across nearly all of Asia as well. By publicly embracing the paradox of tolerance, 
that may arise in a free and open society, it is believed a system of ethics may be devised entirely devoid of natural irony, being the sole punisher of fate, and thus a democratic political system may be devised based on this system of ethics, thus fulfilling St. Augustine's prediction of the ultimate victory of Jesus' city on a hill from his Sermon on the Mount. To the extent we embrace and study ethics, we refute and topple from its throne the rule of irony. Les Miserables is a French historical fiction written by Victor Hugo, 1802 until 1885 A.D., first published in 1862. The plot begins in 1815 and culminates in the 1832 June Rebellion in Paris as it follows the lives and interactions of several characters, particularly the struggles of ex-convict Jean Valjean. The novel is divided into five volumes, each volume divided into several books, each subdivided into chapters, for a total of 48 books and 365 chapters. Each chapter is relatively short, commonly no longer than a few pages. The novel as a whole, however, is one of the longest ever written, with 655,478 words in the original French. More than a quarter of the novel, by one count 955 of 2,783 pages, is devoted to essays that argue a moral point or display Hugo's encyclopedic knowledge but do not advance the plot. Hugo devotes another 19 chapters, Volume 2, Book 1, to an account of the Battle of Waterloo, 1815. The novel opens with a statement about the Bishop of Dean in 1815 and immediately shifts although these details in no way essentially concern that which we have to tell. Only after 14 chapters does Hugo pick up the opening thread again in the early days of the month of October 1815 to introduce Jean Valjean. Valjean's character is loosely based on the life of the ex-convict Eugene Francois Vidor. Vidor became the head of an undercover police unit and later founded France's first private detective agency. He was also a businessman and was widely noted for his social status and philanthropy. In 1828, Vidoc, already pardoned, saved one of the workers in his paper factory by lifting a heavy cart on his shoulders, as Valjean does. Hugo also used Bienvenue de Miolles, 1753 until 1843, the Bishop of Dean, at the time in which Valjean encounters Mariel as the model for Bishop Mariel. A 1998 AD film adaptation of Victor Hugo's 1862 novel of the same name was directed by Billy August and stars Liam Neeson, Jeffrey Rush, Uma Thurman, and Claire Danes. As in the original novel, the storyline follows the adult life of Jean Valjean, an ex-convict, paroled following 19 years of hard labor for stealing bread, pursued by police inspector Javert.
The film changes the names of secondary characters and places to make them more readily understood by an English-speaking audience. Many details of the plot are faithfully reproduced, including the trial at Arras and the death of Gavroche, while entire segments of the plot are eliminated. As mayor, Valjean is aided by a junior police official more loyal to him than to Javert. The Thenardier family appears only when Valjean rescues Cosette. The Petit Gervais episode does not occur. Marius has no family background and is co-leader of the ABC's student revolt. Cosette is far more independent in the film as she suggests leaving the cloister to experience the outside world and challenges Valjean's control of her life. In the film, Valjean explains his past to her directly rather than through whom Mary is. The movie ends with Javert's suicide, eliminating the novel's extended denouement, including the wedding and Valjean's death. In the beginning of the story, Jean Valjean, arrested for stealing bread in 1796 A.D., is released from prison in 1815. When no one is willing to allow the convict to stay the night, Bishop Muriel kindly welcomes him into his home. Valjean explains to Muriel that sleeping in a real bed will make him a new man. In the night, Valjean, interrupted by Muriel while stealing his silverware, strikes him and flees. When the police arrest Valjean for stealing and drag him back to Muriel, Muriel tells them that the silverware was a gift and scolds Valjean for forgetting to take his candlesticks as well. Muriel then reminds Valjean that he is to become a new man. In 1824, Valjean has become a wealthy industrialist and the mayor of the village of Vigo. Fantine, a single mother working at Valjean's factory, is fired when her manager learns she has had a daughter out of wedlock. However, Valjean is preoccupied with the arrival of Inspector Javert, who previously served as a guard at the prison in which Valjean was held. Fantine, in desperate need of money to pay the extortionate demands of Mr. and Mrs. Thenardier for looking after her daughter Cosette, turns to prostitution. Javert starts to suspect that the mayor and Valjean are the same person. Fantine is attacked by some customers, but when she retaliates, Javert beats and arrests her, planning on sending her to prison. Citing his authority to do so as mayor, Valjean insists on her release, and she is let go. Valjean nurses Fantine back to health and promises her that she will have her daughter back. However, the Thenardiers continue to extort more money from Valjean and Fantine on the pretense of Fantine's daughter being ill. Inspector Javert informs Valjean that a man believed to be the real Valjean has just been arrested in Paris. Valjean arrives at court where the man is being tried and reveals to the assembly that he is the real Jean Valjean. Valjean then returns home and finds Fantine at death's door. Before she dies, Valjean promises Fantine that he will raise her daughter as his own. 
Javert arrives at Valjean's home to arrest both him and Fantine. But Fantine dies when Javert tells her she will be sent to prison. Angry and grieving, Valjean fights Javert and knocks him out, then flees the town. Valjean eventually finds and rescues Cosette from the Thenardiers, the corrupt innkeepers who were supposed to care for her, but whom are actually forcing her to be their servant. They care little for the girl, seeing her merely as a way to bring in money, going so far as to offer up Cosette as a child prostitute to the as yet unrevealed Valjean. Both Valjean and Cosette finally make it to Paris, where they start a new life together as father and daughter, cloistered within a religious convent. Ten years later, they leave the convent, and Cosette, now nineteen years old, falls deeply in love with a revolutionist, Marius. Meanwhile, Javert is now undercover as an insurrectionist, trying to undermine the organization to which Marius belongs. During an attempt to finally arrest Valjean, Javert is captured by Marius and is brought to the barricades as a prisoner to be executed. Valjean journeys to the barricades himself when he learns how much Cosette and Marius love each other, intending to persuade Marius to return to Cosette. When the soldiers shoot and kill Gavroche, a young boy allied with the revolutionists, Valjean uses his influence with Marius to have Javert turned over to him so that Valjean can execute Javert himself. Valjean takes Javert to a back alley, but instead of killing him, sets him free instead. At dawn, Marius is injured, and Valjean takes him down a sewer to bring him to safety. Javert catches them, but agrees to spare Marius. Valjean takes Marius back to his home, also saying goodbye to Cosette. When Valjean returns to Javert, Javert tells him that he is now unable to reconcile Valjean's criminal past with his current lawful existence and the great kindness, generosity, and goodness that Valjean has shown, stating, It's a pity the rules don't allow me to be merciful. Javert finally frees Valjean, shackles himself, adding, I've tried to live my life without breaking a single rule, and throws himself into the scene, thus taking his own life. Valjean leaves along the empty street, and a smile spreads across his face. Finis. Franz Kafka, 1883, until 1924 A.D., was a German-speaking bohemian novelist and short story writer. Widely regarded as one of the major figures of 20th century literature, his work fuses elements of extreme realism and surrealist dreamscapes and typically features isolated protagonists facing bizarre predicaments and ineffable bureaucratic authorities. Kafka's work explores themes of alienation, existentialism, anxiety, guilt, and absurdism. His best known works include The Metamorphosis, The Trial, and the castle. The term Kafkaesque has entered the English lexicon to describe situations like those found in his writing. 
Kafka was born into a middle-class German-Jewish family in Prague, the capital of the Kingdom of Bohemia, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, today the capital of the Czech Republic. He trained as a lawyer and, after completing his legal education, was employed full-time by an insurance company, forcing him to relegate writing to his spare time. Over the course of his life, Kafka wrote hundreds of letters to family and close friends, including his father, with whom he had a strained and formal relationship. He became engaged to several women, but never married. He died in 1924 at the age of 40 from tuberculosis. Few of Kafka's works were published during his lifetime. The story collections Contemplation and A Country Doctor and individual stories such as The Metamorphosis were published in literary magazines but received little public attention. In his will, Kafka instructed his executor and friend Max Brode to destroy his unfinished works, including his novels The Trial, The Castle, and America, or The Man Who Disappeared. But Brode ignored these instructions. Kafka's work has influenced countless writers, directors, artists, and philosophers ever since. The Metamorphosis is a novella written by Franz Kafka, which was first published in 1915. One of Kafka's best-known works, The Metamorphosis tells the story of a salesman, Gregor Samsa, whom wakes one morning to find himself inexplicably transformed into a huge insect, literally monstrous vermin and his struggles to adjust to this new existence. The Trial is a novel written by Franz Kafka between 1914 and 1915 and published posthumously in 1925. One of his best known works, it tells the story of Joseph K., a man arrested and prosecuted by a remote inaccessible authority, with the nature of his crime revealed neither to him nor to the reader. Heavily influenced by Crime and Punishment and the Brothers Karamazov, by Fyodor Dostoevsky, 1821 until 1881. Kafka even went so far as to call Dostoevsky a blood relative. Like Kafka's other novels, the trial was never completed, although it does include a chapter which appears to bring the story to an intentionally abrupt ending. In the 1962 film adaptation by Orson Welles, Joseph K. is played by Anthony Perkins and The Advocate by Welles himself. A 1993 film adaptation of The Trial was based on Harold Pinter's screenplay adaptation and starred Kyle MacLachlan as Joseph K. and Anthony Hopkins as The Priest. The Castle is a 1926 novel by Franz Kafka. In it, a protagonist known only as K arrives in a village and struggles to gain access to the mysterious authorities who govern it from the castle. Kafka died before he could finish this work, but suggested it would end with Kay dying in the village, the castle notifying him on his deathbed that his legal claim to live in the village was not valid, yet taking certain auxiliary circumstances into account he was permitted to live and work there. Dark and surreal, the castle is about alienation, 
unresponsive bureaucracy, the frustration of trying to conduct business with non-transparent, seemingly arbitrary controlling systems, and the futile pursuit of an unobtainable goal. Character is a 1997 AD Dutch-Belgian film based on the 1938 best-selling novel by Ferdinand Bordewijk, 1884 until 1965, and directed by Mike Van Diem, born 1959. The movie opens in the Netherlands of the 1920s, when Draverhaven, a dreaded bailiff, is found dead with a knife sticking out of his stomach. The obvious suspect is Jakob Willem Kadderfer, an ambitious young lawyer who worked his way up from poverty, always managing to overcome Draverhaven's personal attacks against him. Kadderfer was seen leaving Draverhaven's office on the afternoon of the murder. He is arrested and taken to police headquarters where he reflects back on the story of his long relationship with Draverhaven, who, police learn, is also Kadderfer's father. His story begins with his taciturn mother, Yoba, working as a housekeeper for Draverhaven. During that time they had sex only once it is implied that the encounter was forced upon Yoba. She becomes pregnant and leaves her employer to make a living for herself and her son. Time and again, she rejects Draverhaven's offers by mail of money and marriage. Even as a child, Katadurfer finds that his path crosses with Draverhaven, often with dire consequences. When he is arrested for becoming involved in a boyish theft and tells the police that Draverhaven is his father, Draverhaven refuses to recognize him as his son. When, as a young man, he unwittingly takes a loan from a bank that Draverhaven owns to purchase a failed cigar store, Draverhaven sues him to win the money back and force him into bankruptcy. Still, Kadderfer manages to pay back the debt, finding a clerical position in the law firm retained to pursue him for his cigar store debt. He manages to secure this job, even though most of his education is derived from reading an incomplete English language encyclopedia that he found as a boy in his mother's apartment. Studying this set, he manages to teach himself English which turns out to be a valuable talent in the eyes of his employers. After paying back the cigar store debt, Kadderfer immediately seeks a second loan from Draverhaven so that he can finance his education and legal studies and, ultimately, take and pass the bar examination. Draverhaven agrees on the condition that he can call back the loan at any time. Despite the bailiff's efforts to hinder his son, Katterdorfer passes his bar examination and qualifies as a lawyer. On the afternoon when his firm holds a celebration of his becoming a lawyer, the day on which the film begins, the day of the murder, Katterdorfer storms into Draverhaven's office to confront his lifelong tormentor, the bailiff. Kadderfer reacts with rage to Draverhaven's congratulations and his offer of a handshake, and though he at first turns to leave, he runs toward Draverhaven and attempts to attack him. After a bloody and angry brawl, Kadderfer is witnessed leaving the bailiff's office. However, the police discover that Kadderfer left Draverhaven at 5 p.m though an examination of the bailiff's body reveals that Draverhaven died at 11 p.m. The police finally reveal to Katadurfer that Draverhaven actually 
committed suicide. After Ketterdorfer is cleared, a police official hands him a document left by Draverhoven's lawyer that turns out to be the bailiff's will, which leaves all of his considerable wealth to Ketterdorfer. The will is signed, Vader, Dutch father. Star Wars is an American epic space opera media franchise created by George Lucas, born May 14, 1944 AD, which began with the eponymous 1977 film and quickly became a worldwide pop culture phenomenon. Lucas is best known for creating the Star Wars and Indiana Jones franchises and founding Lucasfilm, LucasArts, and Industrial Light and Magic. In 1967, Lucas co-founded American Zoetrope with filmmaker Francis Ford Coppola. Lucas then wrote and directed THX 1138 in 1971. Based on his earlier student short, Electronic Labyrinth THX 1138-4EB. Lucas's epic space opera Star Wars 1977 had a troubled production but was a surprise hit, becoming the highest grossing film at the time, winning six Academy Awards and sparking a cultural phenomenon. Lucas produced and co-wrote the sequels, The Empire Strikes Back, 1980, and Return of the Jedi, 1983. With director Steven Spielberg, he created, produced, and co-wrote the Indiana Jones films, Raiders of the Lost Ark, 1981, The Temple of Doom, 1984, The Last Crusade, 1989, and The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, 2008. Star Wars, retroactively titled Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope, is a 1977 American epic space opera film written and directed by George Lucas, produced by Lucasfilm, and distributed by 20th Century Fox. It stars Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, Peter Cushing, Alec Guinness, David Prowse, James Earl Jones, Anthony Daniels, Kenny Baker, and Peter Mayhew. It is the first installment of the original Star Wars trilogy, the first of the franchise to be produced, and the fourth episode of the Skywalker Saga. Lucas began researching the science fiction genre by watching films and reading books and comics. The script would introduce the concept of a Jedi Master and his son who trains to be a Jedi under his father's friend. This would ultimately form the basis for the film and later the trilogy. However, in the first draft, the father is a hero who is still alive at the start of the film. Between drafts, Lucas read Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces and was surprised to find that his first draft was following classical motifs. Lucas completed a second draft in January 1975 as Adventures of the Star Killer, Episode 1, The Star Wars, making heavy simplifications and introducing the young hero on a farm as Luke Starkiller. Anakin became Luke's father, a wise Jedi Knight. The Force was also introduced as a mystical energy field the fourth and final draft, dated January 1st, 1976, 
was titled The Adventures of Luke Starkiller, as taken from the Journal of the Wills, Saga 1, The Star Wars. Lucas worked with his friends Gloria Katz and Willard Hook to revise the fourth draft into a final pre-production script. According to Lucas, different concepts in the film were inspired by numerous sources, such as Beowulf and King Arthur, for the origins of myth and religion. Lucas had originally intended to remake the 1930s Flash Gordon film serials, but was unable to obtain the rights. Thus, he resorted to drawing from Akira Kurosawa's 1958 film, the Hidden Fortress, and Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Star Wars features many elements derived from Flash Gordon, such as the conflict between rebels and imperial forces, the wipes between scenes, the fusion of futuristic technology and traditional mythology, and the famous opening crawl that begins each film. The film has also been compared to The Wizard of Oz. Tatooine is similar to the desert planet of Arrakis from Frank Herbert's Dune series. Arrakis is the only known source of a longevity spice. Star Wars makes reference to spice in The Spice Mines of Kessel and A Spice Freighter. Other similarities include those between Princess Leia and Princess Alia, and between the Jedi Mind Trick and The Voice, a mind-controlling ability used by the Bene Gesserit. Luke's Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru are moisture farmers. In Dune, dew collectors are used by Fremen to provide a small but reliable source of water. Frank Herbert reported that David Lynch, director of the 1984 film Dune, had trouble with the fact that Star Wars used up so much of Dune. The pair found 16 points of identity, and they calculated that the odds against coincidence produced a number larger than the number of stars in the universe. The opening shot of Star Wars, in which a detailed spaceship fills the screen overhead, is a reference to the scene introducing the interplanetary spacecraft Discovery One in Stanley Kubrick's seminal 1968 film 2001 A Space Odyssey. This earlier big-budget science fiction film influenced the look of Star Wars in many other ways, including the use of EVA pods and hexagonal corridors. The Death Star has a docking bay reminiscent of the one on the orbiting space station in 2001. Although golden and male, C-3PO was inspired by the silver female robot, Maria, the mechanoid from Fritz Lang's 1927 film, Metropolis. In a 2005 interview, George Lucas was asked about the origins of the name Darth Vader, and replied, Darth is a variation of dark and Vader is a variation of Father. So it's basically Dark Father. From Rolling Stone, June 2nd, 2005. Vader is the Dutch word for Father. The Dutch word is instead pronounced fa der, and the German word for Father, Vader, is similar. However, in the earliest scripts for Star Wars, the name Darth Vader was given to a human imperial general with no apparent relationships. Lucas also said in 2005 that Star Wars, quote, 
was really about the Vietnam War. And that was the period where Richard Nixon was trying to run for a second term, which got me to thinking historically about how do democracies get turned into dictatorships. Because the democracies aren't overthrown, they're given away. End quote. This claim was likewise backed up by the 1973 draft for the first movie, then called The Star Wars, where Lucas specifically mentioned that the theme involved an independent planet named Aqualai, and that was compared to North Vietnam, and that the Empire was America ten years from now. The political and military conflict of the prequel films, especially Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, bears a strong similarity to elements of the American Civil War, 1861 until 1865. The Galactic Republic's clone army, officially called the Grand Army of the Republic, represents the Union Army, whose veteran organization was named Grand Army of the Republic, while the Confederacy of Independent Systems mimics the Confederate States of America, also abbreviated as the Confederacy. The Skywalker Saga film series, which developed into a trilogy of trilogies, was released beginning with the original trilogy, episodes 4, 5, and 6, between 1977 and 1983, followed by the prequel trilogy, episodes 1, 2, and 3, 1999 until 2005. Lucas has referred collectively to the first six films of the franchise as The Tragedy of Darth Vader. The trilogies focus on the Force-sensitive Skywalker family. The prequels focus on Anakin Skywalker and his training as a Jedi an eventual fall to the dark side to become Darth Vader. The original trilogy follows his children, Luke and Leia, as they form a rebel alliance and battle Vader and his galactic empire. There are many references to Christianity in the prequel trilogy, such as the appearance of Darth Maul, whose design draws heavily from traditional depictions of the devil, complete with red skin and horns. The Star Wars film cycle features a similar Christian narrative involving Anakin Skywalker. He is the Chosen One, the individual prophesied to bring balance to the Force, whom was conceived of a virgin birth. However, unlike Jesus, Anakin falls from grace and seemingly fails to fulfill his destiny until the prophecy comes true in Return of the Jedi. The saga draws heavily from the hero's journey, an archetypal template developed by comparative mythologist Joseph Campbell. Political science has been an important element of Star Wars since the franchise launched in 1977 focusing on a struggle between democracy and dictatorship. Palpatine being a chancellor before becoming the emperor in the prequel trilogy alludes to Adolf Hitler's role as chancellor before appointing himself Fuhrer. Lucas has also drawn parallels between Palpatine and historical dictators such as Julius Caesar and Napoleon Bonaparte as well as former President of the United States, Richard Nixon. The Great Jedi Purge, depicted in Revenge of the Sith, mirrors the events of the Night of the Long Knives, a purge that took place in Nazi Germany from June 30th until July 2nd, 1934. The corruption of the Galactic Republic is modeled after the fall of the Democratic Roman Republic, and the formation of an empire. Darth Vader's design, initially inspired by samurai armor, 
also incorporated a German military helmet. Lucas originally conceived of the Sith as a group that served the Emperor in the same way that the Schutzstaffel served Adolf Hitler. This was condensed into one character in the form of Vader. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace was released on May 19, 1999. It sees the Jedi coming into contact with the young Anakin Skywalker and the corruption of the Galactic Senate by Palpatine, Darth Sidious. Episode Two, Attack of the Clones, was released on May 16, 2000. Two. The story jumps ahead ten years and finds Anakin, now a Jedi apprentice of Obi-Wan Kenobi, pursuing a forbidden romance, as well as the outbreak of the Clone Wars. Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, the first PG-13 film in the franchise, was released on May 19, 2005. It depicts Anakin's fall to the dark side of the Force and his rebirth as Darth Vader. Thirty-two years before the events of the original film, two Jedi Knights, Qui-Gon Jinn and his apprentice Obi-Wan Kenobi, discover that the corrupt Trade Federation has formed a blockade around the planet Naboo. Naboo's Senator Palpatine Secretly, the Sith Lord Darth Sidious has covertly engineered the blockade as a pretext to become Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic. With the help of Naboo's Queen, Padme Amidala, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan escape the blockade. They land on Tatooine to repair their starship and meet a nine-year-old slave named Anakin Skywalker. Believing him to be the prophesied chosen one, Qui-Gon takes Anakin to be trained as a Jedi, but is then slain by Darth Maul. Yoda and the Jedi Council agree to allow Anakin to be trained by Obi-Wan. Ten years later, an assassination attempt is made on Padme Amidala, who is now serving as Naboo's senator. Jedi Knight Obi-Wan Kenobi and his apprentice, Anakin Skywalker, are assigned to protect her. Obi-Wan tracks the assassin, while Anakin and Padme secretly fall in love. Meanwhile, Chancellor Palpatine schemes to draw the galaxy into the Clone Wars between the Republic Army of Clone Troopers, led by the Jedi, and the Confederacy of Independent Systems Droid Army, led by Palpatine's Sith Apprentice, Count Dooku. Three years into the Clone Wars, Anakin becomes disillusioned with the Jedi Council and begins to have visions of Padme dying in childbirth. Palpatine convinces Anakin that the dark side of the Force holds the power to save Padme's life. Desperate, Anakin submits to Palpatine and is renamed Darth Vader. Palpatine orders the extermination of the Jedi and declares the former Republic an Empire. Vader engages in a lightsaber duel with Obi-Wan on the volcanic planet Mustafar, while Padme dies after giving birth to twins. The first installment of the original trilogy, Episode 4, A New Hope, was released on May 25, 1977. In this chapter, unlikely hero Luke Skywalker is drawn into a galactic conflict between the Empire and Rebel Alliance by two droids and an old Jedi Knight. He helps make one of the Rebellion's most significant victories. The first sequel, Star Wars Episode V, the Empire Strikes Back was released on May 21, 1980. 
This installment sees Luke begin training as a Jedi under the last living Jedi Master, Yoda. Luke confronts Sith Lord Darth Vader, whom reveals himself to be Luke's father. Vader attempts to convert Luke to the dark side of the Force. The third film, Episode 6, Return of the Jedi, was released on May 25, 1983. It follows Luke as a full-fledged Jedi. Luke attempts to redeem Vader, thereby saving the galaxy from the Empire. A new hope begins in Meteor Race, when a rebel spaceship is intercepted by the Empire above the desert planet of Tatooine. Aboard, the Imperial warlord Darth Vader and his stormtroopers capture Princess Leia Organa, a secret member of the Rebel Alliance. Before her capture, Leia makes sure the droid R2-D2 will escape with stolen Imperial blueprints for an armored space station, the Death Star, and a holographic message for the Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, who has been living in exile on Tatooine. Along with C-3PO, R2-D2 then falls under the ownership of Luke Skywalker, a farm boy raised by his aunt and uncle. Luke helps the droids locate Obi-Wan, now a solitary old hermit known as Ben Kenobi. He reveals himself as a friend of Luke's absent father, Anakin Skywalker, who was Obi-Wan's Jedi apprentice until being murdered by Vader. Obi-Wan tells Luke that Luke must also become a Jedi. After discovering his family's homestead has been destroyed by the Empire, they hire the smuggler Han Solo, his Wookiee co-pilot Chewbacca, and their space freighter the Millennium Falcon. They discover that Leia's homeworld of Alderaan has been destroyed and are soon captured by the planet-destroying Death Star itself. While Obi-Wan disables its tractor beam, Luke and Han rescue the captive Princess Leia, passing through incredible dangers. Finally, they deliver the Death Star plans to the Rebel Alliance with the hope of exploiting a weakness and launch an attack on the Death Star. Three years after the destruction of the Death Star, the Empire forces the Rebel Alliance to evacuate its secret base on Hoth. Instructed by Obi-Wan's Force Ghost, Luke travels to the swamp world of Dagobah to find the exiled Jedi Master Yoda. Luke's Jedi training is interrupted by Vader, who lures him into a trap by capturing Han and Leia at Cloud City, governed by Han's old friend, Lando. During a fierce duel, Vader reveals the shocking truth about Luke's father. About a year after Han's capture, Luke joins Leia and Lando in a rescue attempt to save him from the gangster Jabba the Hutt. Afterward, Luke returns to Dagobah to complete his Jedi training, only to find Yoda on his deathbed. In his last words, Yoda confirms the truth about Luke's father, and that Luke must confront Vader again in order to complete his training. As the rebels lead an attack on the second Death Star, Luke engages Vader in a lightsaber duel as Emperor Palpatine watches. Both Sith Lords intend to turn Luke to the dark side and take him as their apprentice. Ultimately, Luke disarms Vader, but realizing he is becoming a monster just as had his father, Luke throws away his lightsaber and refuses to end Vader's life. When the Emperor begins electrocuting Luke using Sith lightning, Luke cries out to Vader through the Force. Vader awakens from Palpatine's spell over him and tosses the Emperor down a core reactor ventilation shaft. At the same time, 
the rebel fleet successfully penetrate the second Death Star's shields and detonate its core reactor, destroying the entire incomplete space station and ending the reign of the Empire. The origin of theater dates back to prehistoric shaman performing a reenactment of the Great Hunt for children standing between the firelight below and before them and a massive cave painting of a wild apis above and behind, casting flickering shadows across it so the bull would appear to move. The retelling of this myth of the Great Hunt began gradually to take on various specific characteristics and themes over the many eons, until eventually memorizing an oral tradition containing specific stories became common. According to Harvard Sanskrit professor E. J. Michael Witzel, born 1943 A.D., in his work The Origins of the World's Mythologies, published January 4, 2013, the majority of common themes in the cosmologies and legends of all early cultures the world over seem to have begun in the region of Australia and Oceania by the end of the last North Hemisphere Ice Age, from some 70,000 years ago, when mankind first entered the region, until 12,000 or so years ago, when rising sea levels had split much of the land mass there into islands. It is also to this time period and location we owe the invention of the cat's cradle looped string game and the use of cowrie shells as the first form of monetary currency. The earliest myths all involve a universal deity whom created earth as well as angels or sons of the cosmic god who, according to Witzel, act as tricksters and culture heroes. Mankind was created out of mud from earth by the universal creator deity. However, when humans and the angels began to interbreed, God sent the world flood to destroy all life. Of this era of mythology, Witzel studiously adds, an end to the world is missing, noting that at this stage in storytelling, mankind had not yet imagined a future eschatology, nor a messiah or world savior, which was an aspect of mystic prophecy added to mythologies much later, following the agrarian revolution, some 8,000 until 5,000 years ago. In the first agrarian, Sumerian, Chaldean and ultimately Persian cultures of the ancient Levant, the role of the actor was performed by a shaman or oracle and the role of the theater was performed by the religious temple and attended solely by the high priests and occasionally by royalty. The content of the play was that the oracle would take a hallucinogenic drug, become entranced, and clairvoyantly foresee the future. During this era, also, the Epic of Gilgamesh was written, now considered to be the world's first work of purely novel fiction. From some 2,500 years ago in the Mediterranean, Greek and early Roman drama was performed publicly in an amphitheater, a structure combining a small, raised, half-circle stage and a larger half-circle of steps and seating surrounding this. The audience sat in the darkened arena, and the back of the stage was blocked off by a curtain, mounted to a proscenium arch, 
as a divider between actors and audience, so that the former could perform set changes unseen by the latter. Although myths informed and infused the performances of all plays penned during this period, most of the plays were not taken as the word of God or even as gospel, but were understood to be the playwright's choice for retelling of any given events from their own artistic point of view. Thus, the novel fiction of Gilgamesh became the standard for suspension of disbelief in the earliest dramatic theaters. The role of this form of theater remained the retelling of legends and myths throughout the European Dark Ages as passion plays, festivals reenacting the crucifixion of Christ Jesus. Following the Black Death Plague and the Torturous Inquisition, William Shakespeare, 1564 until 1616 AD, a British playwright under English monarch Queen Elizabeth I, performed his works in the Globe Theatre, a wooden building whose architecture was constructed to mimic the essential features of the Greek amphitheatre a stage, and several levels of seating. In this theater, the balcony seats were reserved for the wealthiest patrons, while the pit between the edge of the stage and the first story of balcony seats was occupied by the groundlings, the poorest patrons. With the Renaissance came the popularization and regularization of musical instrument tuning, and with that began the dramatic art of the opera, combining actors singing and performing on a stage, surrounded by patrons in ascending rows of seats, but with a symphonic orchestra in the pit, formerly occupied by the ground. It was at this point the ancient Greek dramatic division between tragedy and comedy began to be associated with financial class and social status, as the wealthy could afford to attend the pricier nighttime productions of tragedies, while the poor could only afford to attend the cheaper matinee productions of comedies. As such media as three-penny operas and newspapers arose to both inform and reflect the popular views of audience members in all social ranks, the wealth gap between financial classes expanded and became increasingly difficult to tolerate. The results of this dawning of the information age were the many revolutions that occurred around the world beginning in America in 1776 and France, 1789 to 1799. In America, following its war for independence from Britain, the spark of industriousness was soon kindled into the Industrial Revolution, with the invention of steam-powered engines for use in transportation and factories. Not long afterwards, the limelights that had replaced the ancient campfire for low-lighting the actors on stage were themselves replaced by the spotlight of a directed beam from an electrical light bulb. With the spotlight came the packaging of performers as products, billing them as stars, and ultimately the birth of the 20th century Hollywood studio system, which transformed the dominant means of public performance from live theater into cinema. With the invention of the motion picture film recording camera, humanity harnessed what French Swiss film director Jean-Luc Godard, born 1930 AD, has called truth at 24 frames per second. 
the earliest short films shot and developed by Thomas Edison in America and Auguste and Louis Lumiere in France during the turn of the 20th century were produced solely as entertainment but were already experimenting with movie magic methods of splicing, editing, lighting effects, and shot composition, which remain fundamental features of this new technology to this day. When the Central Bank of the U.S., the Federal Reserve, was established in 1913, the American economy had reached a point of success that allowed D.W. Griffith 1875 until 1948 to produce the world's first feature-length silent black-and-white film The Klansman nowadays recalled as The Birth of a Nation in 1915. In the roaring 1920s cinema industrialized art by making it possible to mass manufacture for global distribution countless replicas of a single recorded performance and thus also threaten to usurp the role traditionally played by live theater. A role theater, lest we forget, had once also usurped from the oracular priestcraft's temples of old. In a sense, Cinema fulfills an oracular role in modern theatrical temples that live action cannot, by allowing special effects to paint the screen like a blank canvas, thus permitting the camera to show us literally anything we can imagine. The ability of film to let audiences in darkened theaters enter into the mind of a character by literally seeing the world through their eyes has proven a massively useful tool for inducing empathy and thus has become weaponized to generate sympathy for certain causes and mistrust for others mainly by the US military for political agendas. Propaganda films are among the most deeply ingrained of modern myths in the collective psyche and are the most difficult to deprogram oneself from because they are the simplest and most skeletal format for expression in this medium. The weaponizing of cinema as political propaganda holds true even more so for the first colorized movie the Wizard of Oz, 1939, than for Triumph of the Will, 1935, a Nazi propaganda film directed by Lenny Riefenstahl, 1902 until 2003. Because The Wizard of Oz was purely fantasy fiction and could thus address more archetypes in our collective unconscious, as we are all at times lost, brainless, heartless, or gutless. While the triumph of the will merely objectively records the 1934 Nazi Party Congress in Nuremberg, attended by more than 700,000 Nazi supporters, and includes speeches given by Adolf Hitler and Rudolf Hess, among others. While the meaning of the message is as plain as the difference between day and night in one, the moral lessons one may find from the other are manifold and technicolor. Thus, The Wizard of Oz is actually far more dangerous a piece of propaganda than even Triumph of the Will, as Wizard of Oz succeeds at subtly influencing the viewer's minds in every way that Birth of a Nation succeeded, while in all those ways, Triumph of the Will remains more merely an archival documentary. In spite of the early and great long-term critical successes of Citizen Kane, 1941, 
an American drama film by Orson Welles, 1915 until 1985. Its producer, co-screenwriter, director, and star. The majority of Hollywood movies produced during the Cold War continued to be driven largely by military-industrial motives, resulting in films like Them, 1954, and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, 1956, continuing to promote the so-called Red Scare, Panic of the Era, over Soviet spies in Western nations. Meanwhile, the Soviets themselves were developing what they called truth cinema, Russian Kino Pravda, consisting throughout the Soviet Union's history until its fall in 1991 of a combination of educational documentaries and absurdist futurism, ranging from Battleship Potemkin, 1925, a silent film directed by Sergei Eisenstein, and produced by Moss Film that presents a dramatized version of a historic battleship mutiny from 1905, to multiple productions of The Master and Margarita, a satirical novel about the devil visiting the Soviet Union by Russian writer Mikhail Bulgakov, 1891 until 1940, written in the Soviet Union between 1928 and 1940, during the regime of Joseph Stalin. That decade between 1991, when communism collapsed in Russia and the Berlin Wall, symbolic of the Cold War era's Iron Curtain policy, was finally hammered down. And September 11, 2001, when, allegedly, Al-Qaeda a terrorist training network formed from the post-Soviet collapse Mujahideen detonated and collapsed the World Trade Center Twin Towers in New York and bombed one wall of the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. using hijacked commercial airliners. Produced dozens of legendary films and introduced many inspiring new directors. Ahead of the pack came Kevin Smith, born 1970, writer, director, and co-producer of Clerks, 1994, an American independent black-and-white buddy comedy film that was shot for $27,575 and which grossed over $3 million in theaters. Also that year, May 1994, at the Cannes Film Festival, Pulp Fiction premiered, an American neo-noir black comedy crime film written and directed by Quentin Tarantino. Natural Born Killers came out that same year, on August 26, 1994, an American crime film directed by Oliver Stone and based on an original screenplay by Tarantino. Following these successes, the Hollywood studio system decided to test the waters for future projects by releasing Devil's Advocate, 1997, an American supernatural horror film about an unusually successful young Florida lawyer invited to New York City to work for a major firm. As his wife becomes haunted by frightening visual hallucinations, the lawyer slowly begins to realize the owner of the firm is not what he appears to be, but is in fact the devil. This film was followed up by Pi, Faith in Chaos, 1998, an American psychological thriller written and directed by Darren Aronofsky in his feature directorial debut. The story about a mathematician with an obsession to find underlying complete order in the real world contrasts two seemingly irreconcilable entities, the imperfect, irrational humanity and the rigor and regularity of mathematics, specifically number theory. The Truman Show, 
1998, was released in that year as well, an American psychological science fiction comedy drama about Truman Burbank, a man who grew up living an ordinary life that, unbeknownst to him, takes place on a large set populated by actors for a television show about him. Eventually, he discovers the truth and decides to escape. As the turn of the third millennium and end of the first eon, A.D. approached, Hollywood studios outsourced to smaller studios and risked releasing a bevy of edgy and avant-garde films along with others, such as the first Star Wars prequel, pre-designed to make the sum $924.3 million it grossed in theaters. Columbia Pictures and Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer celebrated their 75th anniversaries in 1999. In a November 26, 1999 article written for the periodical Entertainment Weekly, journalist Jeff Gordon Air speculated 1999, the year that changed movies, and quoted election director Alexander Payne as saying, It's like 1939, concluding, not since the Annus Mirabilis of The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, and Stagecoach has Hollywood brought so many narrative innovations screaming into the mainstream. Groundbreaking films released in 1999 include Stanley Kubrick's final film, Eyes Wide Shut, the science fiction hit, The Matrix, the sleeper hit, Snuff Flick, The Blair Witch Project, Best Picture winner, American Beauty, Kevin Smith's Dogma, Spike Jones and Charlie Kaufman's breakout film, Being John Malkovich, M. Night Shyamalan's breakout film, The Sixth Sense, Fight Club, directed by David Fincher and based on the 1996 novel by Chuck Palahniuk, and Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia, to name only a notable few. Not only was 1999 a banner year for creators of unique content, it was also considered a kind of year of the devil, with the character of Satan or some similar supernatural demon being portrayed in a number of films, from Darth Maul in Star Wars Episode I, to Gabriel Byrne in End of Days, to Nicolas Cage's figuratively haunted ambulance driver in Bringing Out the Dead, to Patricia Arquette's apparent possession by Christ in Stigmata, to Kevin Bacon's literally haunted house in Stir of Echoes, to the Invisible Witch in The Blair Witch Project, to the actual actor John Malkovich in Being John Malkovich, to the kid who can see dead people in Sixth Sense, again, to mention only a notable few. Following 9-11, 2001 AD, the Los Angeles, California, in New York, New York, produced media content, including the military and central intelligence agency's long-standing monopoly on content control in Hollywood and their fleet of corporate news channels, saturated with spies sharing globalist talking points via Project Mockingbird, has become decreasingly relevant in the increasingly telecommunications technology-centric society of the early 21st century. With the rise of free video sharing social media websites like YouTube, owned by Google, in turn owned by Alphabet LLC, we are finally approaching the age when that proclamation, declared by Aleister Crowley, in 1907, over a century before now, that every man and every woman is a star, 
may finally come true. In the current era, 2020 CE, by creating low-budget content on social media websites like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, and partnering with an MCN, multi-channel network service provider, one can monetize their airtime by selling it to advertisers and drive traffic to one's content using robot viewers provided as part of their service by these MCNs and thus become internet famous and Bitcoin rich, all from the comfort of one's own parents basement. Now the internet is corporatized by big media companies desperate to cling to the relevance they enjoyed in a television dominated age and these relentlessly censor and ban any competitors who become too popular and threaten to challenge their authority by expressing any contrary views. The World Wide Web of 2020 is an anti-intellectual cesspool of unsubstantiated personal opinions, amateur podcasters, sock accounts, chat bots, and shadow banning algorithms all being employed by different factions ranging from the Pentagon to Antifa, from Pornhub to QAnon. Although the dark web and BitTorrenting is still viewed as illegal digital piracy of copyrighted content and so remains unexplored by most net users, it exists and will eventually be more fully explored and integrated to daily routine. According to mythologist Joseph Campbell, 1904 until 1987 AD, author of Hero with a Thousand Faces, the work referenced by George Lucas while writing the second draft for Star Wars. The rituals of initiation of young men in some of the very simple societies are extremely interesting. The boys are brought up to be in fear of the masks that the men wear in their rituals. These are the gods. These are the personifications of the powers that structure the society. The boy, when he gets to be more than his mother can handle, the men come in with their masks, or whatever their costume is, and they grab the kid, and he thinks he's being taken by the gods. He's taken out and beaten up and everything else. But then, there in New Guinea is a wonderful event when the poor kid has to stand up and fight a man with a mask. They say he's fighting the god. The man lets the kid win, takes the mask off, puts it on the kid. Now, the mask is not there, defeated, and simply said, oh, it's just myth. It said, the mask represents the power that is shaping the society and has shaped you, and now you are a representative of that power. In this manner, the archetypal role of that torturous trickster, the absentee or deadbeat dark father figure, is associated with the idea of a terrifying, wrathful, and jealous creator god and a universal deistic or demonic demi-urge. It becomes prevalent whenever any society passes peak imperialism and begins to decline into a strict tyranny. The reason for this was explained once in a poem by the lead singer of the psychedelic rock band The Doors during the later 1960s and early 1970s AD. Jim Morrison whom said, When the true king's murderers are allowed to roam free, a thousand magicians arise in the land. In short, as post-industrial corporate imperialism expands and pollutes apparently exponentially, countless so-called false prophets have arisen to cry wolf 
about the traditional consequences for embracing such amorality. Until now, people have become all but totally zombified by their cellular devices and social media, desensitizing them to eschatological conspiracy theories that, regardless of all proving false so far, nevertheless yet shadow our modern zeitgeist. The ill omens of superstitious beliefs, such as that we are already living in the Vedic Hindu Kali Yuga, or fulfilling 2,000-year-old prophecies from the Book of Revelation by St. John of Patmos relating to the so-called end of days, cast shade across all we can accomplish now. Those mindlessly immunitizing the eschaton in the name of spiritual ascendance seem incapable of realizing that means their own deaths. In order to absorb the injustice of the dark father role existing, to accept its right to exist and allow it to do so peacefully, one must overcome their fear of this shadow self component of their own psychology and learn to love and accept it. To rise above the reaches of this six loka cycle of abuse of Vajra spinning samsara, one must learn to forgive and grow beyond all animosities and reject clinging to such self destructive patterns as expecting any certain outcome. As inferred by Campbell, the distinction apart from, confrontation against, passive acceptance and ultimately active taming of this Jungian shadow self archetype are such deeply ingrained, cyclically recurring phases in human psychological development that they have become stages on the hero's journey in the mono-myth itself. Some claim the 12-step programs of Alcoholics Anonymous groups, helpful in processing of emotional trauma and abuse recovery, or so-called self-help and personal wellness. And these include such steps as accepting the existence of a higher power, making amends with past victims we have hurt throughout our lives, and, ultimately, learning to forgive and accept ourselves as imperfect people who are only able to do our best, hoping this will prove good enough, thus simply trying to heal one day at a time. Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, some 558 to around 491 BC, taught that it was best by the eightfold middle path that one could transcend into nirvana, a mental trance state of oneness with all existence, and leave behind the four noble truths of suffering innate to our physical realm. Buddha's mythic transubstantiation beneath the Bodhi tree, in which he confronts Mara, his own shadow self, just before attaining nirvana, remains, even if more fiction than fact, an artistic testimony to the value and virtue of Buddha's statements transcending his own lifetime. While passive meditation may be sufficient for Buddha to tame his inner ego, it also is true that interpersonal activities remain necessary for an average aspirant to the Eightfold Path, such that people, like mirrors, may present one another with an opportunity to better equilibrate with and absorb their own shadow self. When one confronts one's innermost shadow self and accepts it as a part of oneself, one attains psychological apotheosis in nirvana. 
neither the passive nor active way is altogether wrong, nor, by itself, altogether right. Ultimately, the truth of that garden of forking paths is, to each their own, all roads eventually lead back to Rome. To tame the shadow self, one must first realize and accept their own villainy, both intentional and not, so as to cease accidentally and subconsciously projecting blame for this displaced karma onto others. Before one has properly aligned their shadow self, this archetype of the Dark Father follows them around like an imaginary lightning storm, clouding their invisible aura and blinding them from being able to see beyond it. This curse possesses the mind even of anyone just passing by such a person so accursed by sending out invisible, tentacle-like servitors to connect their minds via semi-sentient pulses of static electricity, only to share their mutual distaste for the human condition. Being thus unpleasantly tethered to the sufferer of this type of syndrome, an average stranger will begin to suspect a sinister darkness shadowing the soul of such a victim of shell shock or post-traumatic stress disorder brought about by the cycle of abuse almost immediately. The disgust others feel for this form of depression is not meant to reflect on the character of the person suffering from it. Depression is a contagious mood disorder and the result of abuse, not personal choice. It is right for people to instinctively reject it as it threatens their very life. Nevertheless, Usually, the person suffering from depression mistakes this revulsion by others at their depression for a rejection of themselves by all people outright, though this is a false assumption. Feeling disappointed, frustrated, and isolated, the sufferer of chronic or long-term depression battles against their shadow self alone inside their mind all the time. What does it mean for the Dark Father archetype to only be an externalized projection of one's own shadow self? For the Dark Father archetype to be unmasked requires removing the mask from the other and placing it over one's own face instead. This means transference of all prior animosities associated with that mask will be shifted immediately back onto themselves, as they are the new heir of that same social role's identity. The alienated Dark Father archetype must be reintegrated with the primary ego or central self-concept by first realizing the role of shadow self being projected onto someone else in the form of the Dark Father archetype cannot be 100% villainous and evil, but must yet contain some percentage portion of heroism and honest good. To the extent there is still good in the villain, the villain ceases being 100% a villain and becomes an anti-hero or a combination of villainous evil with virtuous goodness. What is the relationship of the shadow self to the anti-hero role? In order to reject using one's personal capacity for evil, one must first accept the fact of this capacity to do evil already existing innately within oneself. Next, one must study and learn from this shadow self, or that externalized dark father archetype, even going so far as to try to see the world through their eyes, with the ultimate goal of reducing the villainous evils done by the dark father or the shadow self to the lesser charges of accidental learning opportunities 
and the reduction of this role overall from villain to merely anti-hero. It is easier, ultimately, to accept an anti-hero than a villain as an ally, and likewise, so too is it easier to want to save one's own shadow self than to think themselves able to save the Dark Father archetype universally. To save the Dark Father archetype, one must learn to see oneself through the eyes of their own worst enemy, and then practice letting go of all animosity they had held for all their enemies, so that, ultimately, one's imagined nemesis may become one's real friend. Only when Mara sees Mara through the eyes of Buddha, may Mara cease clinging to Buddha and allow Buddha to transcend. Only when Buddha sees Buddha through the eyes of Mara, may Buddha cease clinging to Mara and allow Mara to attain Nirvana. Nowadays, psychiatrists identify at least three types of paranoiac themes experienced by people suffering from cognitive disorders, such as schizophrenics or people on hallucinogens. These are themes of possession by 1. the religious type, including demons, and the devil, as well as Christ and God. Two, the supernatural alien type, including the appearance of ghostly, alien-like forms. And three, the governmental type, including conspiracy theories about government-funded human experimentation that have often actually proven true. The popularization of psychedelics in the 1960s AD, immediately following the assassination of U.S. President John F. Kennedy, caused an entire generation to experience these symptoms in some form or other, usually combined. This generation gave birth to the children who came of age during the turn of the millennium, and this corresponded, coincidentally, to the crowning of a new American century of corporatism and endless war, as long planned by the U.S. DOD and CIA, a period I call peak imperialism. The psychedelics wave of the 1960s leading up to the turn of the millennium and the event of 9-11-2001 are predictably recurrent events in a much larger galactic scale cycle, which, I might add, we are still going through today, even as I write these words, in 2020. During this all, what may we learn about ourselves as a species by looking into the social mirror of film collectively in darkened theaters? Once we've gone through the looking glass, what monstrous challenge awaits us inside this shared communal dream? Perhaps most importantly, why should any nemesis haunt us at all? In some cases, art imitates life, and in others, vice versa. In examining the role of the Dark Father archetype in modern cinema, we must be careful if we are to presume we can be this character's judge. In all the cases we've now examined here, from Icarus and Oedipus, to Caesar and Jesus, 
to Jean Valjean and Javert to Anakin Skywalker becoming Darth Vader. Irony is this recurring character's fatal flaw. However, as we've also posited, the modern American format of government combining Greek democracy and Roman republicanism began as an experiment to realize Christ's city on a hill by, essentially, dividing human ethics apart from the divine law of irony. The result of this has been, as I said, the political pendulum's revolutions between the so-called left and so-called right wings of a duopoly system that none dare call conspiracy, yet that everybody knows is systemically impacted by the law of irony. The tactic Christ was using to perhaps postpone the inevitable has been turned against the masses by a counterfeit elite. Rather than dividing irony from ethics, now people are divided within themselves by vestigial, competing political party lines that seemingly gain them higher wages at best and at worst can cost them their lives. The late 20th century was very much defined and guided by predictive programming. First, they show you what they will do, then they do it. When they do end up doing it, you already expect the outcome they showed you to happen the same way for you. This is also called hiding in plain sight, a tactic recommended for Satanists in the late 1970s by Anton LaVey. What they are doing by showing their intentions in movies beforehand is like them slapping someone else in front of you and then starting to walk toward you next. It makes you anticipate the slap. It's just a way to psych out the weak-minded. It gets in people's heads, and so then the masses all expect a certain pre-programmed result to occur. You know those scenes in torture movies where the person is about to be tortured, and the person who's going to torture them walks through the door and rolls out their toolkit. That's what corporate entertainment media is like. It is a form of psychological intimidation, a form of torture. First they show you, then they do it. Take the apparent similarities between Dune and Star Wars, for example. Well, of course these two sources have similarities to one another, regardless of which came first, because both sources are metaphorically describing, in a sci-fi setting, the geopolitical landscape of the modern world. Whether portraying Iraq as Arrakis or Tunisia, as Tatooine. What we are seeing is a psychological operation, a psyop, being performed subliminally on our subconscious while we are consuming these modern myths. Modern audiences are undergoing a process of transference whenever they are fed mass media fictions. They are forced to put themselves into that position of the characters in these films and thus learn to self-identify with the archetype of their own worst enemy. This form of propaganda is meant to induce a subconscious Stockholm Syndrome in the masses and bypass one's instinctive reflex against loving your enemy. Historically, the artistic veneration of villains and their literary humanizing as anti-heroes corresponds to periods of wanton decadence 
and rapid economic decline in the era that tends to follow peak imperialism. Luckily, this phase is usually short, 